But anyway, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. We're thankful, Father, for the relationship that your son provides to us. And, uh, and I pray that you help us to make the choices that we need to make so that we can take advantage of that opportunity. Father, we, uh, uh, we, we, we long to be with you. But while we're here, we ask, Father, that you help us to be the people that we're supposed to be. Father, help us to look, uh, look on, on the work here and look on the work around us and, uh, and understand what our responsibility <clears throat> is. Father, we pray for the Gale family. We pray for Brent and his family as they drive to Austin. Keep them a safe trip. Help them to be, uh, be able to accomplish the things they need to accomplish while they're there. We pray for little Eleanor and we pray for her family. Uh, we pray for her doctors as they, uh, as they minister and work on her, that you will guide their hands. And Father, we pray for Marlon and Kim and that whole family as they deal with his, with his illness. And thank you uh, for the opportunities that are coming because of that. Father, we ask your blessings upon our class today as we study, and we ask your blessings upon us as we worship this morning together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Paul has told you over and over and over again how what his relationship, how he felt about the relationship with the church at Thessalonica. He says early on, he says, I felt like I was orphaned, like I was ripped apart. He longed to understand what was going on with them. He longed to understand what was happening with them because the circumstances he left in, if you remember, when he leaves, he leaves and they imprison a guy who won't tell them where he's at. His name is Jason. They make him postpone and then let him go and they sneak Paul and Silas and Timothy out in the, in, you know, and get them out, out of harm's way. And, uh, and he has not had an opportunity to go back. Yet he sent Timothy. Remember, we, finished, we closed that. We sent Timothy. Well, in the text we're going to have today, Timothy's back. Timothy's come back to give him a report. And we're going to look at the report. And the way we're going to look at this is, is that uh, there's a few things that, they're, that Timothy's going to tell them. He's going to tell Paul that he's going to relate to us. Now, remember, all right, this is a letter not written to you. This letter wasn't written to you. It was written to the church of Thessalonica. But we can learn some things from it. And I want us to look at this report and look at what is said, what he tells, what Timothy tells him, and ask yourself, if that was me, what am I doing? And how would this connect with me? All right? I want to, I want us to we're going to start in verse 6. six. Chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter six, chapter 3, verse 6. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news. All right, I'm going to stop right there. You hear what he says? He's just come. What is, he, what is he doing? What is he doing? As soon as he hears, what's he doing? What, but what's he doing? But what is Paul doing? As soon, he said he's just come back. Now what's he doing? Writing a letter. I'm writing a letter. As soon as he comes back, I'm writing a letter. He's just come back, and I'm going to write back to you. I'm going to let you know what he's told. Look at what he said. But Timothy has just now come back to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you also long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecutions, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. I'm going to stop right there. All right? A couple of things he says here. He said he's brought good news about your faith and your love. What is he saying? Tell me what, he, what, you think, what you think the report is as he brings it back and he says he's brought us good news. It's the same, it's the same idea of the, of the evangelistic good news. He's brought us good news about your faith and love. What's, what, is, what do you think Timothy came back and told him? What do you tell him? Got good news about his, their faith and love. That they believe the message. They believe the message, okay? What else? They are lacking things. That's at the end, but, but first off, what is he saying here at the beginning? What does he say? He's brought us good news about your faith and your love. Let's start, let's, I'm going to take them in steps, all right? We're going to get to that in a minute, all right? Maybe we won't today, but we're going to get to it. But I want to know, what, is, what is, yeah, Robert? They haven't abandoned it. They haven't abandoned it. They haven't abandoned their faith, okay? You understand what faith is? 
You understand what it is? You, you understand? Faith is when you believe in something so strong that caused you to act upon that belief. They believed what they heard. They believed it. And they were acting accordingly. What did that look like? Tell me what it looked like. Now, I want to ask, I want, remember, if, if, if I could say or you could say about yourself, somebody sees, they're going to see my faith, and they're going to be blessed because of it. What would you be doing? What would you be doing? They believed in Christ. The suffering. I, I want to take you just for a minute. Take you back to Second Thessalonians, just a couple pages over, and look at chapter one. All right, look at chapter one. Now we're going to get there at some point. We're going to talk about this in detail, but I want you to look at what's said here. All right. Look at verse four. That's all we're going to read. Verse four. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecution and trials you're enduring. All right? Now, what's going on here? What's going on in these people's lives? Tell me, what do you think? What's going on here? Extreme person. They are, they are struggling. There's stuff going on in their lives that they can't, they can't wrap their minds around. There's extreme persecutions and trials in their life. We don't know what they are. I have any idea? We can imagine. You know what I know? There are extreme things going on in your life. Some of them you've caused. Some of them you've done yourself. Some of it other people have done. And you know what you've done? You've acted accordingly. In many instances, you acted accordingly. And that's not a good thing. That's not what they did. What did they do? In spite of what happened, they never abandoned the faith. We're going to look at that when we get into what they stand firm. But he said, you know, I want you to ask yourself, if I believed in, with all my heart that Christ died for my sins, then do I have a responsibility to live a certain kind of life? Yes. You do not have the right. I do not have the right, okay, to look at life and say, well, you did this, then I'm going to do this. Because you did this, I get to do this. No, you don't. No, you don't. Ladies, husbands, children, you have no right to do whatever you want. Faith doesn't allow you to do that. Doesn't. He brought a good report about their faith. They believed. And we're not going to turn over. If you want to write this down, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, then without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without this kind of faith, it's impossible to please God. You don't get the, you don't get the choice to do whatever you want. You understand? You can't say, well, the people in my past hurt me. Well, uh, well, they, I got fired and it wasn't my fault. So what? So what? You don't get that right, okay? People of faith are people of faith because they trust who? Not your boss, not your husband, not your wife. Who? You trust God. You know, got a lady here that got run over by a car. So what? I have, hey, I applaud her for being here for growing. Look, she, she's up, up vertical, man. That's awesome. You know what? She still has a responsibility to be the Christian she's supposed to be. I don't care if a truck ran over her. I don't care what persecutions are in our lives or what we perceive as persecutions. Sometimes Satan gets in our head, head and he starts to remember. He's already talked about this three times about Satan getting in their lives. He's going to talk about it again. In, in, late, in just a little bit, you'll talk about it again. You know, so if their faith and love, you, know, you understand, if God's, God says, I want you to have a faith in me that overrides that garbage. You don't let that dictate how you live. You don't get to dictate. Well, somebody in my pet, well, you know, you just don't understand. No, I don't. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, guys, because faith has to override that. That's what's happening here. Timothy called back and said, you can't believe what these people are doing. I watched these people get beat up on the street. And they laughed, and they, they thanked God for it. You remember Paul and Silas? You remember him, them two? When they're at Philippi, right before they get to Thessalonica, you know what happens to them? They get beat up. They get beat up, and then they throw them in the dungeon. They don't throw them in the jail. They throw them in the, in the, they throw them in the belly of the beast, and they lock them in stocks. And you know what they're doing? You know what they're doing? Singing. They're singing and praying. They're, they're, really? That's faith. I believe in God so strong that he's going to act upon my belief. He's going to do what he tells me he's going to do. That's, that's what that faith. 
And you know what happens? Earthquake comes, they get out of the stocks, they don't run off. They convert the Philippian jailer because of it. You think they had any clue when they were under the whip that that was going to happen? Yes, they did. I told you a couple of weeks ago that every one of you in here has problems. And Satan has attacked every single one of us. But you know what he can't do? He can't take away what God has given you. Only you can give that up. Only you can do that. Satan can't do that. He can't. So when you look at this and he said, he said he brought us a great report. Good news about your faith and your love. What about their love? You know, tell me. How does, how does, well, I'm going to go to go to a text in a minute. What do you think, what do you think the love was about? I, do, I want to take you, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I've told you already before, if you want to be humbled, come over here after after lunch, I mean after service today, and come over and watch these kids recite this stuff. All right? They're going to recite this stuff. All right? They, they have this memorized. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Most of you didn't even know this text was here. Okay? Didn't have, didn't have a clue that it was here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 1. If, he said, and now at the end of... He said, now I'll show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. That's, that's, do you hear what he said? He said, I, they brought good news about your faith and your love. He said, if I don't have this, then the other one don't mean anything. Look, And he said, if I, have, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's what they had. That's what they had. That's the good news. When, when, he, when he looked at this, he said, he brought us good news about your faith and your love. What were they doing? What were they doing? How, how did this? How did this love? How did this love make uh, make life easier for them? How, how do you think that that kind of love? That kind of love. First Corinthians thirteen talked about. How did it? How did it make? How can it make life easier? And how do you think it made life easier for them? They're going through persecution. You don't even have a clue about. You don't have. You have any idea what what might be happening in their lives that you're never going to have to experience? Yes, sir. They, Fellowshipping with each other. Okay, fellowshipping with each other. All right. They were fellowshipping with each other. What else? You think anybody wronged them? You think you, you think any of them had had a had issues? You think all of do you think that every single one of them had a mate that bought into everything they were doing? No. So what kind of problems did that bring along? You think they that these people didn't have jobs? Yeah. You think their their employers bought into everything they were doing? You think? How about their kids? What if they had teenage kids? Okay. You think their kids bought into everything they were buying they were doing? Let's say, let's say daddy decides he's gonna follow Jesus. They're pagans, okay? They pagan worship. The little boys are looking, can't wait till they can get to be part of that pagan worship because of all the because of the sexual immoralities there. Them little boys are, man, they, we're going to get involved in this. And daddy says, we're not going there no more. We're not going to do that anymore. You think, you think little Johnny, who's about 15 years old, 14 years old, you think he's, you think, you think that didn't cause a rift between him and his daddy? You think? Because now, you know, we got to go to church all the time. We got to be around these holy rollers all the time. You think that didn't cause a problem? You think that was some of the problems they may have had? How'd they override that? They loved each other anyway. They loved each other in spite of that. They brought 1 Corinthians 13 that they didn't even know. That text wasn't even written yet. Okay? But Paul, Paul had told them over and over. Paul had instilled in them all of this. And so you look around and you say, okay, well, if I'm, what am I doing? If, am I, can I, am I promoting faith and love? Would people see this kind of faith and love in my life? That's, that, hey, that's what they said. You know, God has good news about your faith and love. 
then look at what else he says. And he says, and he says uh, back in back in uh, in First Thessalonians, he has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us, and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Pleasant memories? He brought pain and strife in their life. He brought beatings and imprisonment. That's what he brought in their life. Uh, not so much. What did he bring? You know, what did, what did he bring? What did he bring in their life? Huh? Huh? He brought Christ in their life. What did, how did that change things? How, how did it change? What, what happened because of it? Huh? Gave, did that change the way they perceived life? You know, now they're looking at Paul and saying, man, I can't wait till I see him again and thank him for the beatings that I've gotten. What? You understand what I'm saying here? You know, when we become Christians and we start following Christ, we have to have a different perspective on things. It can't be the way it was before. <coughs> Otherwise, what good is it? We don't need Jesus for that. We were already doing that. <coughs> Jesus is supposed to bring something different. And he brought this. He brought a different mindset for these people. And he said, therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecutions, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. See? He, th he says it again. And he said, for now we really live since you are standing. What do you mean really live? You, you understand? You try to get yourself into Paul's perspective. Now I'm really alive because now, now I know that everything's okay. Because Timothy's brought this report. Now we can really live because you are standing firm in the Lord. You understand what that text means? You understand what, he, what he's saying here in, in, about standing firm? It's a military term. That's that term, standing firm, is a military term. I didn't write the word down because I wouldn't have been able to pronounce it anyway. Uh, but it's a military term, and it means not to retreat in face of attack. No retreat. That's what it means. You don't retreat. <laughs> you know, you don't retreat. And, you know, you, if you, you know, I'm, I'm, I love to watch, I love to be, a, to, to do history about World War II stuff. And I do a lot of, and to see some of the, some of the hero, heroism of some of the, the combat soldiers on the ground and some of the things they did. Uh, you know, I'm not even going to call names, but there was guys at Guadalcanal, there was guys at Iwo Jima, there was guys at Tarawa that, some of them died. Some of them died, you know. They uh, they jumped on grenades in front of in front of uh, in front of their men, um, in front of their not even their men. Just a pro private would jump on a grenade and get blown up so to save his men. You know these guys. Some of them won con congressional medal of honors posthumously because they were dead and they brought them back. You know, a guy named Basilon was at, at at Guadalcanal got a got a uh, held a held a machine gun with his bare hands and burnt both of his hands and still killed numerous Japanese. You know, just I mean, amazing stuff. Okay, not going to retreat, no back down. We're not giving ground, not giving ground. That's what this means. I'm not going to give a ground. We've got a worse enemy than they had. We've got an em enemy that can kill you forever. Okay, can kill you dead forever. <coughs> And and so he said he said we've gotten a report that you're standing firm. Tell me, what what uh what do you think was in their life that helped them to stand firm, to stand planted and not give up and face? Yeah, you know, we already read the verse four in chapter one of, of Second Thessalonians. We know that they're suffering severe, not just trials, severe persecution and trials. And he tells them later on in that text in chapter one of second the second letter. He said, Jesus is going to come back and take care of it. Don't worry. He's going to come back. And he's going to, he's, going to, he's going to bring retribution and judgment with him when he comes. He said he's going to come back with blazing fire with his powerful angels and take vengeance. It doesn't say, it says vengeance. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? Sound like something we have for some people sometimes, doesn't it? That we have no right to have, doesn't it? You know, somebody does something to us. Somebody does something to our families. What do we want to do? Take vengeance on this. We don't have that right. That's Jesus' plan. That's Jesus' job, right? We're supposed to have faith and love, right? This stinks, don't it? This, st this stinks, don't it? I want to, I want to, man, I want, I want to hit somebody. I want to hurt somebody, right? Don't you know what that person did? We don't have the right to do that stuff. You understand what he's saying here? You know, you stand firm. How do you? What do you think it looked like? For them standing firm up under this pressure, what do you think that looked like? 
The other people may have had, made them think they're weak. Yeah, Scott. What was the gentleman that spoke yesterday? Uh, Matthew. Matthew. Sitting right back so, there. You know, he referenced a couple of verses. One of them was in Philippians uh, chapter four, I think, verse seven. Uh -huh. And Paul and Silas gave them a plan uh -huh. of what to do during all these persecutions. And one of those plans is is to not worry, uh -huh. not be anxious, uh -huh. and and through prayer and supplication that they so that they now have a alternative out for all these things that they've been facing whether whether it was the the jewish high council and you know because there was a jewish synagogue paul and silas went into mm -hmm. in Thessalonica, or whether it's yeah. other people at work or family members like you mentioned mm -hmm. uh you know that there, there's a lot of freedom in in faith and love that there isn't when you don't have that you're absolutely right you hear that y'all y'all hear it? there's there's a freedom in faith and love that you don't have outside of it there's a freedom there you know, and he was talking about Matthew yesterday. He talked about stress, and he brought up Philippians chapter 4, and about we need to pray, we need to turn this stuff over to God, and let God handle this stuff, because sometimes the stress is worse than, you know, you can't deal with it on your own. You just can't. You know, and so, you know, when, when you look at this, and he says he stands firm, you know, I want to I know what were they doing that helped them to stand firm? That They were praying a lot. They were connected together a lot. What were they doing? How did they stand firm, or did they give up? Yeah, John? Well, jumping ahead, in the fifth chapter of Thessalonians, being the pen of Benjamin, uh -huh. I recognize something that they were doing. Okay, go ahead and read it. He points it out. That Hold up. Chapter 5, verse what? 11. Yeah, that's a, that's a verse. Go ahead. Go ahead and read it. Yeah. Oh, read it. Yeah, go ahead and read that verse. Or just tell us what it says. Well, the first thing he tells us to do is build each other up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Build, and you know, a war situation, you don't hold the guy next to you whining about uh, you wanting to stand firm. And well, you don't you want the guy next to you. got to build him up. You don't want the guy next to you mad at the world over what you don't know. You know, you know, you don't want the guy next to you, you know, not exerting the same faith and love because this is supposed to be a team effort, right? Not just in a family, but in this family as a whole. You know, what I mean, it, it. You know, he said, he says, uh, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy you have in the you you have in the presence of our God because of you? You know, I, I, you know how proud I was yesterday. You have no idea how proud I was yesterday. I was sitting right here, and Matthew was standing right here, and he was talking to 40 guys who every single one of them, he could have looked at and said, I'm way down here, they're way up here. That's really how he could have looked at them. He didn't. He got up here, and I know how scared he was. I know how scared he was. I've been there. And, man, I, man, I, just, I looked at him, and I said, man, it's awesome. And it and it he walked off and he's fixing late because he had to go to work and it's, he's walking off and he's right back there. You know who else was here? His uncle. Chris was here. And they were right over there and they were hugging. They were hugging right there. Because Chris was even prouder even than I was. And I told whoever was sitting here, I said, You see that? I said, You see that kid right there? I said, All I did was put him in the water. That's all I did. I said the one that taught him was Chris and Ellie. They taught him. Because they lived it in front of him. They lived it in front of him. And I was so proud of him. I was so happy for Chris that he got to experience that. He came, he had to go to work at 8.15. That's the reason we ate early, because he had to go to work. So we, we moved the time up a little bit for him so he could be here to see and witness what Matthew was going to do. You know, so when he says this, he said, I understand exactly what he's saying here. How proud he was. How full of joy he was for those people. He was late. He ached because he said, I'm not there. I can't help them. It's like when you have kids and you got to you got to send your kids off, you know, send them off to kindergarten or something. Or you send them, you know, like our, one of ours went in the military. You know, we're handcuffed. We ain't nothing we can do. We're done. Somebody else is going to be on, be on his case, not me anymore. You know, I don't have that. I don't get that that right anymore. You know, he's grown into a man. He got, he's on his own. But you know how scared you were? You understand how scared you are when they when they first, you know, that's where Paul was. He was terrified that the, that the enemy was going to win in their life. He was scared. You know, and here he said, he said, man, you're standing firm. What did you think Timothy brought and said, hey, guy, 
You don't have to worry about them because this is what they're doing. What do you think the standing firm looked like? What do you think it looked like? You know, we know in a in a battlefield situation, you know that you know get, you know we're gonna we're gonna hit. This is the perimeter. This is what we're gonna do. This is our method of attack, and this is how we're not gonna back. You know, you you coach football. You know, if you may lose every game, but you want your 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 kids to never back down, right? Keep fighting. You may lose fifty to nothing, or you may lose fifteen to fourteen. Don't quit. Don't quit. You know what happens sometimes? We give up and quit. Is that a form of faith and love when we give up and quit and say, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't care about you anymore. You know, I don't love you anymore. You know, I'm going to do this. I don't. So I quit. I give up. Is that what he's telling us here that we get? That, do we have that right to do that? Is that standing firm? I know of a, I know of a, of a, of a couple. And I know of a guy who has every right, he has every right to, and, and there's, it's not anybody in here, okay? I'm just, I'm just, I'm, it's somebody I know. And, uh, and he has, he has, a, he has some issues with his wife that are, that are dire, okay? They're dire. I mean, they're dangerous issues. And he told me the other day, he said, I will never leave her, no matter what. What? You know, this is this is dangerous dire. I'm not leaving her. I'm gonna be with her till the to, till the end, till the long haul. I'm going. Standing firm. I ain't gonna give up. I'm not gonna give up. She may give up, but I'm not giving up. I'm staying put. I'm here. I'm in it for the long haul. That you know, so what do you think they were doing? You know, what do you think? You know, when Timothy comes back, he says, Pass, Saul, good, leave me, you ought to see this. What do you think he told him? What do you think he told him? Yeah, David? They were encouraging each other. Okay, they were encouraging each other? Anybody else? What do you think? Encouraging each other? Picture in your mind. Read between the lines. All right? Just go along with your picture. Read between the lines. One. Of, hold on a minute. Hold on. You read between the lines. All right? He said, they're standing firm. You're standing firm in the faith. A couple goes out, they're going to go talk to somebody about Jesus, and somebody catches them on the way. Some of the enemy catches them on the way. Beats them down in the street. Beats them down in the street. Beats them up. Okay? They come back black and blue, black eyes, bloody nose, and everybody gathers around them and encourages them and lifts them up, you know, and, and elevates them. And they, and they see the guy's who did it, maybe one of them's alone, and now there's four or five of them and one of these guys. And he goes up and says, man, can I tell you about Jesus? I want to tell you about this guy. You know what? Most of the time, what doesn't convert people is reading them out of the book. That doesn't convert them. You know what converts them? Watching your life. That's what converts them. You want to convert your kids? Is that what you want to do? How many of you don't want to convert your kids? You all want to convert your kids, don't you? Grandparents, you want to convert your grandkids? Live it in front of them. Every single second of every single day, live it in front of them. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And if you've got a problem with each other, take it in the back room. Take it outside. Take it down the street. Take it somewhere else. But don't don't make the mistake we did. We're over here singing, oh, I love Jesus, man. On the way home, we're fighting like cats and dogs, screaming at each other in the car. Three little kids in the back seat watching all this. You know, should I be ashamed of myself? Absolutely. Many times I've asked for forgiveness. Please, God, don't tell that to their account. Please, don't do that. Let them grow through this and past this. Let them see something else now that they didn't see them. So, you know, you don't have a lock on this, on this nonsense. We've all done that stuff that we're not proud of. You know what we do now? Is we stand up, we stand firm, we don't quit, and we let our love and our light and our faith shine like a, like a bright star. And no matter what happens, we're going to stand up for Jesus every single day. That's what's going to convert your kids. That's what's going to convert your neighbors. Letting them see something special that they don't see anywhere else. And it may not. And then when it gets to a point where you need to teach them the book and you can't do that, then bring them to somebody that can. There's lots of people here that can. That know how to teach them the book. 
and then you can teach them. You know, yesterday, uh, Keith and Gracie's son was here. Remember the remember the kid that, that almost died in a motorcycle wreck? Remember him? We prayed about him. How many of you really believed that your prayer was going to do any good? How many of you really believed that? How many of you said, eh, probably not so much. We've seen it before. You don't have to raise your hands. I don't want, I don't want to see it. You know, but I know that there was some here. He's been to church two weeks in a row. Last week he brought his kids. Yesterday he was sitting right there, all right, with one of his boys and his and a buddy from work sitting right there. Yeah. You know? You know what's going to convert that kid, that those kids and that guy? Not what Cole taught teaches him, not what I teach him. You know what's going to convert him? The lifestyle of these two right there. Because they loved him in spite of what he was doing, in spite of what happened, they loved him anyway and didn't give up on him. That's faith and love. That's standing That's standing firm. That's what they were doing. That's what we need to do as a church. If we do that, guess what Satan can't do here? He can't win. He can't win. He can try, but he can't win. Now, he, he may cause problems, but you know what happens when he causes problems? We just get stronger. Because we look at the problems from a different perspective. We look at them as a blessing, not a problem. That's what we do. Right? Isn't that what these guys were doing? That's what they had to have been doing for them to get the report like this. And look at what he said. He said, he says, uh, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray more earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Okay, here we go. Here's what we're, did, you, did you bring this up while ago? What's lacking in our What do you think that means? If he's got this great report about their great faith, great love, standing firm, man, you're happy, you're good. Then what do they still need? What do you think they still need? They had concerns. They had concerns about the resurrection. Okay. They had concerns about the resurrection. Okay. What what do you think? What do you think they needed? They he we're gonna he's gonna he's gonna what did he say? He did he's gonna supply what is lacking in your faith. How many of you are perfect where you are? I, I agree with you, Robert. I am perfect. I'm perfect in God's eyes, from God's perspective, but not in real life. Not, and I don't think you would say that either. Ever. But in, in real life, I'm not perfect. Neither are you. I need things in my life that I have not gotten yet. I need God to supply more things in my faith yet. And my faith is still growing. My faith is going to continue to grow. The more that I'm a part of this, my faith is going to continue to grow. So what are you still lacking in your faith? I need to be more patient with my wife. All right? We're in a different place than we were before. I need to learn how to be more patient with her. And she'll tell you, I'm not very patient sometimes. Sometimes sometimes I can get uh, just a little unpatient, too quick. That's something that's lacking in my faith. I need to do that. You know? What is it in your faith that, that, that you're still lacking, that, that someone needs to supply, that God needs to supply for you? What are you still lacking? Trust? Anger? Is that, you know, maybe s control something from the past? Maybe something from the past that's eating on me, and I need him to give me some kind of clarity of thought, some kind of mindset, because I still can't get a handle on them? And if you got something in your life that you just, you, you wish you could stick a knife in it and kill it once and for all, you think? Any of you? You can go like this, because most of us have something in our lives that we wish we hadn't, that wasn't a part of us, that wish we hadn't been involved in, or wish somebody hadn't been involved, some of that stuff. You know, we know that we have, I see you, now you're shaking your head. Yeah, now you understand what I'm talking about. You know, do you handle that well sometimes? Mm, not so much, right? Don't kind of really handle it so, so well. How many of you, how many of you have gotten a handle on all that stuff? Because we need to talk. I want to know how. So that I can get a handle on my stuff. Okay, I want I want to talk with you. Maybe you can supply what's still lacking in my faith. Do you think that that happens sometimes? You know, I mean, you know, you can you Matthew can look at all, and I'm I'm sure he looked when he walked in and he saw all these guys in here. You know, he felt like, what am I doing this for? <laughs> Why am I in here? These guys, man, I don't know nothing compared to these guys. Did you not think that? You did, didn't you? <laughs> and all these guys are 10-foot giants. And he's looking at them like, oh, man, why did I say yes? And remember something. I didn't go to him. Okay, 
he came to me and said, I want to do this. Did, did that, right? He said, I want to do this. You know, what I'm saying is, is in spite of the 10 foot giants in your life, what he found out, they ain't giants. They're guys just like he, he is. They sweat and bleed just like he does. You know, and they love, they, they, they have issues in their life. They love like he, just like he does. They're no different. He had something to say that only he could say. And he said it. And he said it. You know, and it, and I'm looking at this, I'm saying, what is he still like? You know, Matthew will tell you, he's got a lot he still needs to learn and grow in. So does Robert tell you the same thing. Cynthia will tell you the same thing. I've got places I need to I need to grow up in. There's things that I just can't get a handle on yet. Guess what? I want Jesus to come back and find us all still struggling with life and things in our life. Because that means I'm growing. I want him to come back and find us growing. Do not ever, ever get in front of God and say, I have arrived. Here I am. Because if you go to some of the texts, he'll say, shame on you. Shame on you for that. He says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, and the truth's not in you. Well, if I still have sin in my life, then that means i got things I need to get a handle on. Right? Right? And these guys, Paul knew that, and he knew that if he could come, and he could be with them. He could encourage them and lift them up and supply them with those things that they were still lacking in their faith. Evidently, they were doing pretty well. When you say that, it seemed like they were doing pretty well. And I look around this room and I see, man, people are doing pretty well. But you know what I know? There's still stuff in your life that you struggle with. And sometimes it turns you into a person you don't want to be. It turns you into a monster that only Satan could create. Right? Am I not right? Absolutely. Every one of us. And, and, and our faith and love and our, our steadfastness would not be there for that moment in time. And we need to eliminate those. Because we're the children of God. Don't ever forget who you belong to and whose you are. Jesus died for you on the cross. He resurrected out of the tomb to give you life. You couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. They couldn't do that. Only he could do that. And he did it so that you could live. And if you were the only one, he'd have done it for you. Okay? All right. We're going we're gonna to pick it up here next week. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something.